Okay, welcome to the Chapter 4 homework review. The average this week was pretty good at about 9.76 out of 12. Um, so we're still doing pretty well in terms of scores. We just have to keep using these homework assignments as a, as a learning tool to make sure that we're mastering the material on a weekly basis. Um, so in Chapter 4, there's several topics covered, but they're all sort of extensions of some things we learned in Chapter 3. In particular, in Chapter 3, we learned about covalent bonding. We learned about Lewis structures, which sort of designate the valence electrons and how they're arranged in a covalent molecule. And then in chapter four, what we do is we take the Lewis structure and we sort of take it a step further and, and, and sort of use that to make predictions about the three-dimensional structure, the molecular polarity, and then things about bonding as well that we learn in the context of both valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory. Um, so there's you know several topics here, but they're all sort of related to the structure and bonding in covalent compounds. And so we're going to go through problems that relate to all of those topics today. The first thing I want to do before I start any problems is clarify some terminology. So in the um, in predicting the three-dimensional shape of molecules, we use the approach called VSCPR, valence shell electron pair repulsion. And there's sort of two classifications that we want to be familiar with that come out of that uh, treatment of molecular structure. And I don't think we had any huge problems on this, but I just want to make sure we're clear on it since it's probably something that I didn't go over in class as clearly as I could have. So the two uh, ways that we classify molecules are in terms of their electron group arrangement or their molecular shape, molecular geometry, molecular structure. Those three things sort of all mean the same thing. So electron group arrangement is the one that It's going to depend on all of the valence electrons that are around the central atom, which includes the bonding and the non-bonding. And it's determined by the total number of electron groups. So when you have a, a Lewis structure and you have you identify your central atom, the, no, the electron groups are going to be either an atom that's bonded to that central atom or a lone pair on the central atom. And so basically, there's only five possibilities for electron group arrangement, and that's determined by number of electron groups that the central atom has. In total, it doesn't matter whether they're you know, an atom that's bonded or a lone pair or some combination. So if you have two electron groups, the electron group arrangement is going to be linear. Three electron groups, trigonal planar. Four electron groups is tetrahedral. Five electron groups is trigonal bipyramidal. And six electron groups is octahedral. So these are the only five possibilities for the electron group arrangement. And the number of electron groups, as we said, can be any combination of either an atom bonded to the central atom. We don't care what the bond order is, just whether it's bonded or not and the number of non-bonding lone pairs. Um, so each lone pair counts as one electron group, and then each atom bonded to the central atom counts as one electron group, whether it's singly, doubly, or triply bonded. So those are the only five possibilities for electron group arrangement. The molecular shape, or as we said, it can be called molecular geometry or structure as well. The molecular shape is sort of a, a subcategory of the electron group arrangement. So each electron group arrangement is going to have usually two or more possible molecular geometries that sort of fall under that. Um, and so the molecular shape is a subcategory of each electron group arrangement. There's, um, so there's more possibilities for, for molecular shape than there are for electron group arrangement. And it also then is going to be depend, it's going to depend on how many lone pairs you have on the central atom. So for the molecular shape, we only sort of classify the shape of the atoms themselves, and we ignore lone pairs. So I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, but suffice it to say, there's more possibilities, and in this case, we're basically, the, the, the lone pairs are going to determine to some extent what the shape is, but we're ignoring them when we're classifying that shape. And so one thing we also said in class was that if you have no lone pairs in the central atom, the electron group arrangement is the same as a molecular shape, but any time you have one or more lone pairs on the central atom, the molecular shape is going to be something different than the electron group arrangement. And again, we're not going to go through all the possibilities, but it's important to know that there's these sort of two classifications, and so when you're doing problems on this, make sure you 
look at them closely. All right, so with that out of the way, let's get into the problems then that we're going to cover this week. These were all ones that we had success rates of 60% or less on, um, so ones that I think it's good to revisit. So the first one is about molecular structure, sort of using the concepts we just reviewed. And here we're dealing with ClO2. Now I suspect that in this problem, part of the confusion was because this is a molecule that has an odd number of electrons, which we haven't dealt with too much yet. Um, so we're, we're going to still follow the same rules for drawing the Lewis structure. So we're going to count valence electrons for chlorine and oxygen, add them together. So chlorine is group seven, so it's going to have seven valence electrons. Oxygen is group six, and there's two of them, so each going to contribute six valence electrons. So this is a species that has 19 electrons. So we didn't do a lot with odd electron species, but we're still going to follow the same rule. So we're going to go Cl in the center, oxygen, oxygen with single bonds. Complete the octets on oxygen first. All right, so that's what we have. And then now what we've done is we've used 2 times 8, which is... 16 electrons. We have three left, and those are going to all go in the center atom. So we're going to pair two of them, and we're going to have one that's unpaired. Now, again, this is something we haven't dealt with a lot before, but one thing that's important to realize is that if you have a single unpaired electron, that still counts as an electron group. It has to occupy an orbital. Um, you can't just have an electron, you know, freely floating around. So anything that occupies an orbital is going to count as an electron group. So each pair of electrons normally counts as electron groups, but if you have one that's unpaired, you'll have in, the, in a you know Lewis structure, you'll have no more than one that's unpaired. If you have one that's unpaired, that's going to also count as an electron group. So the electron group arrangement for this molecule, this chlorine in the center is going to have a total of four electron groups. It's going to have two oxygens, one lone pair, and then one unpaired electron for a total of four. One, two, three, four. Um, we could evaluate this. We probably should draw some double bonds here as well, but that's not going to really change the story in terms of molecular structure. So I do think the best Lewis structure for this would have, if you look at what we have right now, we only have two, four, six, seven electrons around the central atom. So we should put at least one double bond to give it more than eight electrons, so it's not deficient. Uh, we could probably put a second one to, to get rid of the formal charges as well. Um, but nonetheless, whether we have the double bonds or not, we're still going to come to the same conclusion about the molecular structure because whether it's double bonded or single bonded, we still count each oxygen as one electron group, and then the lone pairs in the center atom, another electron group, and then the unpaired is one. So four electron groups. So the electron group arrangement is going to be tetrahedral. And then when we put the electron groups around there, what we're going to get is tetrahedral arrangement. And then two of those are going to be occupied by a lone pair and, an, and a single electron, and the oxygen is here. And then this is going to be a bent geometry. Or if we want to put it in the AXE notation, this is AX2, E2. And even though, again, E usually is a whole pair of electrons, if there's one individual electron, that would still count as an electron group, so it'd be AX2, E2. Now that's all well and good, so we would identify the geometry as bent, and we see that bent is none of these answer choices, so that's the correct answer. But we probably could have gotten that faster, because as we said in class many times, if you have, this is an AX2, E structure, there's two atoms bonded to the central atom, some number of lone pairs that we would determine if we needed to. But in this case, when you have AX2, a central atom, three, and two outer atoms, in other words, three total atoms, your only two choices are bent or linear. That's all it can be if you're talking about the molecular structure. So if you look at the answer choices, none of those are bent or linear, so then none of the above is definitely the correct answer without even drawing the structure. So sometimes on these problems, it is helpful to think ahead a little bit and look for, you know, look for patterns, look for logical choices. And if you have a structure that only has three atoms in it, it has to be bent or linear. If we're talking about molecular structure, not electron group arrangement. And none of those are there, so then you just choose none of the above. And again, I realize there's always a hesitation to choose none of the above, but that is the correct answer here. All right, so the next problem here deals with bond angle, which is going to follow directly from a molecular structure. A little bit of capitalization problems here. There should be a lowercase e, so it's H2SE, um, selenium 
I guess dihydrogen selenide, if you want to do the name of that. So again, we need to draw a loose structure of this, and I'm not going to go through all the details on that, but what you get for SEH2, just single bonds of hydrogen, of course, and then two lone pairs. So this is once again AX2E2. Now when you're talking about bond angle, the bond angle is going to come from the electron group arrangement. It's going to primarily be derived from that. So if this is a tetrahedral electron group arrangement, because there are four electron groups, two plus two, the bond angles are going to be close to that magic 109.5 degree angle. So anytime you have four electron groups, whether it's AX4, AX3E, AX2E2, all those different possibilities, you would expect the bond angles to be close to 109 degrees. Now in reality, they're going to be a little bit less because the lone pairs do repel the bonding pairs and, and compress the angles a little bit, but they're still going to be close, so the best answer for this is going to be 109. So when we ask you about bond angles, you do need to get the structure and, and figure out at least the electron group arrangement um, to be able to determine what the structure, what the, what the bond angles are going to be. Um, and so if you have a bent structure that's based on the tetrahedral electron group arrangement like we do here, this would be a bent molecular structure, but because it's derived from the tetrahedral electron group arrangement, that's why the bond angles are going to be close to 109 degrees. All right, the next few problems deal with polarity. So if we say has a dipole moment, that means is polar. If we say does not have a dipole moment, that means it's nonpolar. So there's a lot of a couple of different ways of saying that, but we're basically making predictions again whether the structure is polar or nonpolar. Now there's a few we can look at. So if you have the AXE notation, all X is the same, then there's some things that we want to look at. So if there's if it's AXME0, meaning there's no lone pairs on the central atom, it's going to be nonpolar. If it's AXME1, that's going to be polar. If there's one lone pair on the central atom. And then if it's going to be, if it's linear, there's a lot of structures that are, you know, again, we have just three atoms, it's either going to be linear or bent. Any of the linear structures are nonpolar if all the X's are the same, and the bent structures are polar. And that takes care of most of the structures. There's two others that don't fit into this pattern. There's the AX4E2 and AX5E that you need to learn, but just about all the structures that we would would have are going to fall into one of these categories. So what is what we need to do for, for these to decide if they're polar or nonpolar is just determine the molecular shape, determine the electron group arrangement, you know, the AXE notations in particular. So if we go to choice A, I'm not going to go through all the details, but what we would find for BH3 is that this is AX3 with no lone pairs. So again, anything that doesn't have lone pairs on the central atom is going to be nonpolar, meaning it does not have a dipole moment. For choice B, SIF4, we get AX4, again E0, so it's going to be tetrahedral, but no lone pairs on the central atom makes it nonpolar. But then for choice C, SF4, what we would get is AX4 E1. So I encourage you to draw these Lewis structures and make sure you can verify what I'm saying is true. I'm not going to go through the details like I said, but we do get one lone pair for SF4 E1. And again, anything that has one lone pair is going to be polar. For O2, it's a linear molecule, it's just diatomic. So for, for diatomic molecules, molecules that just have two atoms in them, the polarity is determined by whether the two atoms are the same or the two atoms are different. So in O2, we have two of the same atom. Which means it's nonpolar. So you know, N2, O2, Cl2, F2, whatever, two of the same atom bond together makes it nonpolar because the electron activities are the same. But typically if it's two different atoms like CO or NO or something like that, it's gonna be non it's gonna be polar. So this one would be nonpolar because both the atoms are the same. So the only one of these that has a dipole moment, which means it is polar, is gonna be choice C. One lone pair is a dead giveaway that it's gonna be polar. All right, very similar problem for the next one. So let's just go through these again with the same sort of arguments. So for choice A, CH4, what we would get is AX4 
E0, no lone pairs on the center atom, all the outer atoms are the same. So for all these molecules, they all have just one type of outer atom, CH4, CCl4, CO2, SO2. So we can use the patterns that I described in the last problem as well. So with no lone pairs on the center atom, here again, we're looking for one that has a dipole moment. So we're looking for the one that is polar. No lone pairs means that it's nonpolar. So this one's nonpolar. For choice B, CCL4, again, it's just carbon at the center with four things bonded to it. So without even drawing the Lewis structure, we can suspect that it's going to be AX4E0 because carbon would not want to expand its octet. So if it has four things bonded to it, it's going to be AX4 nonpolar. CO2, we would get AX2. Again, no lone pairs in the center atom. Typically with carbon at the central, you don't have lone pairs. So if carbon is bonded to two or four of the same thing, it's going gonna, it's gonna to typically be nonpolar. And that's what we see for CO2 as well. AX2, E0, it's a linear molecule. The two dipoles cancel out. So the first three are all nonpolar. But then for choice D, what we would get if we draw the Lewis structure is going to be it's SO2, so it's three atoms. It's going to be either linear or bent, but in this case we get AX2E1, one lone pair in the central atom. I believe that's correct. Yes, AX2E1. Um, and so because we have one lone pair in the central atom, that's going to be polar, and it's a bent molecule. So as we said, any of the bent molecules are going to be polar, any linear molecules being nonpolar if, if all the outer atoms are the same. So this one's bent, has one lone pair, so by both those arguments it's going to be polar, and that's going to be our answer choice. So even though molecular polarity can be a little bit tricky at times, for most of the problems that you get, they're going to be like this. You're going to basically use these patterns that I described above. There's a couple others that don't fit into this, I guess, so I guess I'll write those out now. AX5. Uh, there would be, let's see, which ones are there? There's AX4E2, which is square planar, it's going to be nonpolar. And then AX3E2, which is T shaped, would be polar. So there's a couple that don't quite fit these easier patterns above, but the vast majority of structures, no lone pairs, nonpolar. One lone pair, polar. Linear, nonpolar. Bent, polar. The vast majority of things fit into those categories. Some of them fit into more than one of these categories, and you can make predictions that way. And so for most of the problems, that's all you really need. Now this next one here, though, requires us to think a little bit more critically. So here we gave you three isomeric structures. So isomers are basically molecules that have the same chemical formula but different structures. Um, and these molecules, because we have a carbon-carbon double bond, you can't rotate a pi bond without breaking it. So all these three structures are distinct from each other. Um, and we want to know which of the following has a dipole moment not equal to zero. Again, that's a fancy way of saying which of these is polar. If you have a non-zero dipole moment, that means you're polar. And so three choices or, or some combination of those three is going to be our answer. So what we need to think about for these is, first of all, if we, if we think a little bit about the structure, in all these cases, the carbon atom is AX3. It has three things bonded to it. So we're going to have trigonal planar, sp2 hybridized carbon atoms. Now that's not terribly important, but what it is important to realize that comes from this is that these molecules are all flat. So the molecules are all planar. Now that helps us because what that means then is that the bond dipoles are all on the same plane and it's a little bit easier for us to decide whether or not they cancel or not. So if we look at choice one here, Chlorine is more electronegative than carbon, so we're going to have dipoles going from carbon to chlorine. And then hydrogen is a little bit less electronegative than carbon. They're not that much different from each other, but there's going to be a small dipole going this way. And so basically what you have in this molecule is clearly the dipoles don't cancel out. You have vectors that are basically all pointing down. So this molecule would have a net dipole, if you think about adding all these vectors together, that goes top to bottom. So because it has a net dipole, this one would be polar. But if we go to choice two here, which just puts, now puts the chlorines on opposite sides of each other, in this case you're going to have dipoles from hydrogen to carbon that are facing each other and thus cancel out, and then dipoles from carbon to chlorine that are in the opposite direction exactly 180 degrees apart. So in this molecule here, all the dipoles cancel out. The CH dipoles point towards each other and cancel out. 
the CCL dipoles are oriented opposite of each other and cancel out, and so this one would be nonpolar. All right. And then this last one here, which puts the two hydrogens on one carbon and the two chlorines on the other, dipoles going like this. They're not going to cancel each other out because they're pointing in the same direction. And then similarly, the dipoles going towards chlorine don't cancel each other out either. They sort of reinforce each other in the x direction. And so this molecule would have a net dipole going left to right and would be polar. So if these choices, one and three, are both polar, and the only way we could easily determine that is as I did here, which is to draw the individual bond dipoles, chlorine more, more electronegative than carbon, carbon a little bit more electronegative than hydrogen, and when you draw those dipoles, you figure out do they or do they not cancel out. And only in choice two here are the dipoles arranged equal and opposite of each other such that they would cancel out. The rest of them, the dipoles, do not cancel, which makes the molecules polar, so one and three are both polar. All right, the next couple questions deal with hybridization. So hybridization comes from the valence bond theory, um, which is the bond theory that supposes that we have either atomic orbitals or hybrid orbitals on each atom that are overlapping with each other, but we still have basically localized orbitals on each atom. And mostly what we have to do in this is just predict the hybridization of one or more atoms in a structure. So the first one here is the molecule HCN. So if we want to draw the Lewis structure of this, we can go either the long way or the short way. Um, so HCN, we have hydrogen, which has one valence electron, carbon, which has four, it's in group four, and then nitrogen is in group five. So we have a total of 10 valence electrons in this molecule. So if we go HCN, carbon having, being in the center here as is, as is written in the formula, we'll start by completing the octet of the nitrogen. Hydrogen just gets a single bond, of course. Now when we've done that, we've already used all 10 valence electrons, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, but our carbon atom here only has four electrons around it, two from each bond. So if we want to make our complete octet on carbon, we need to take off two lone pairs from the nitrogen and pair, turn it into a triple bond. So this molecule is going to have this structure. This would also come from following the patterns that I've talked about before in class in the review sessions where you have typically four bonds to carbon, one, two, three, four, and then nitrogen is going to have three bonds and a lone pair to complete its octet. So those patterns are all met here, and this gives us a structure that has complete octets in all the atoms and um, no, no formal charges. Now, it's not so important for this that we get exactly the right loose structure, because even if we had not drawn this as a double, as a triple bond, if we had either left it as a single bond or drawn it as a double bond, that's not the correct structure, but we would still predict the hybridization in the same way. So hybridization is determined by the number of electron groups. Um, and so again, there's only a few possibilities here. But basically, if we look at this central carbon here, there are going to be two, two electron groups attached to it. It's bonded to the nitrogen and to the hydrogen. It has no lone pairs, so it has only a total of two electron groups. Remember, we don't care whether an electron group is singly, doubly, or triply bonded. It just counts as a single electron group no matter how it's bonded to the central atom. So one electron group, which is nitrogen, one which is hydrogen, total of two. If you have two electron groups, you're going to hybridize two orbitals. So on, on carbon, we would have an s orbital and three p orbitals available for hybridization. Two electron groups requires that we hybridize two of those. So we're going to take the s and the p and make it sp hybridized. And so choice A would be the correct one here. Now another way to think about this also is that in this Lewis structure here that we've drawn correctly, we also have two pi bonds. Remember that this triple bond is going to be a sigma bond and two pi bonds. If you're going to have two pi bonds, you need to have two unhybridized p orbitals. The only way you can get that is if you just hybridize one s and one p to make it sp hybridized. So there's a couple ways of, of thinking about this, but this, I think the most straightforward way is just to count the number of electron groups or the steric number of the central atom as I've called it before. Two electron groups means we hybridize two orbitals, S and P, to make it SP hybridized. All right, and then this uh, next problem that deals with hybridization is a little bit more involved. So we gave you a skeleton structure for tetracyanoethylene, and we want to determine the following, how many of the atoms are SP hybridized. So again, it is helpful for this to fill in the whole Lewis structure. And we have carbon and nitrogen, so we're going to follow the following pattern. Carbon wants to have typically four bonds and zero lone pairs to complete its octet. Nitrogen prefers to have three bonds and one lone pair. And the reason it follows this pattern is basically, again, to complete the octet, 
and minimize formal charges. So that's what we're trying to do here. And so if we look at the structure, it's probably best to start from the outside and work our way in. So the nitrogen here only has one bond, so it wants to have two more. So we'll draw, we'll make a triple bond to carbon to make three bonds to nitrogen and also give each one a lone pair. And we have four nitrogens in the structure that are the same. So triple bond and a lone pair. And by doing that, we see that these four carbons that are bonded to nitrogen are now happy because they have a total of four bonds, three from the triple bond, one from the single bond. So we're not going to do anything else to those carbons. But then if we go to the two carbons at the middle here, right now they each have only three bonds. We can't draw any more bonds towards the outside because that will give these carbons more than four bonds. But if we draw one more bond between them to give those two a double bond, now each of those carbons has four bonds as they want. So this is the completed structure of tetracyanoethylene. We want to know how many of the atoms are sp hybridized. Remember the atoms that are sp hybridized are going to be ones that have only two electron groups. All right, if you have two electron groups, as we said in the last problem, you're going to hybridize two orbitals making it sp. So if we look at nitrogen, we're looking how many of the total atoms, not just carbon atoms, we're going to look at all the atoms. Nitrogen, this one has two electron groups is bonded to a carbon and it has a lone pair for a total of two electron groups. So each of those nitrogens is going to be sp that you each have one carbon bonded to them plus one lone pair for a total of two electron groups. And then these carbon atoms that are bonded to the nitrogen by the same token are going to also be sp hybridized. They're bonded in this case to one nitrogen and one carbon for a total of two electron groups. Each of those is going to be sp. And then if we go to the two central carbon atoms each of these has three electron groups. They're bonded to a total of three carbon atoms. Single bonds to these two, a double bond to the other one in the center. And so basically, you're going to have sp2 for both of those because they each have three electron groups. For, for three electron groups, we need to hybridize three orbitals. And so the ones that have three electron groups are going to be sp2 hybridized, those two in there. So the total number that are sp hybridized are going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So 8, choice D, should be the correct answer. Um, so again, hybridization, you just need to basically fill out the loose structure and then count number of electron groups in each atom. Um, and by the same token, as we talked about in the last problem, if you have two atoms that are triply bonded to each other, that typically is going to involve sp hybridization because in order to have a triple bond, you need to have two unhybridized p orbitals to make two pi bonds. And so triply bonded atoms tend to be sp hybridized, and that's exactly what we see here. Each nitrogen and each carbon that's involved in the triple bond is sp hybridized, so there's a total of eight in this whole structure. All right, the last few problems now are going to deal with molecular orbital theory. So anytime we see problems that ask us about the bond order of diatomic molecules, we now immediately want to think of molecular orbital theory because that's the theory that allows us to deal more accurately with diamagnetic or sorry with, with diatomic molecules, predict the bond order, predict whether they're diamagnetic or paramagnetic. So I'm going to go through three problems here. The first one deals with bond order, the next two are a little bit more complicated. So the first one here is going to be C2 plus. And so if we're going to be dealing with the so if we go to the, the periodic table, recall that there's a slight switch in the ordering of the molecular orbitals depending on whether it's the first half or the second half of the P block. So for, for boron carbon nitrogen, the first half of the P block, we have one order of the, of the molecular orbitals. For oxygen, fluorine, neon, we have a different order. So for this one, we want to use the order that applies to the first half of the P block, which means that, again, what we really care about is just the ordering of the molecular orbitals. So you're going to have, from the 2s orbitals, you're going to get a sigma and a sigma star. And then from the two p orbitals, for boron, carbon, and nitrogen, the lowest ones are going to be the pi, and then the sigma. And this is especially important to get it right if you're talking about number of unpaired electrons. And then we have pi star and sigma star. All right. Now in class, we drew the atomic orbitals that these come from. So we would have, for example, 2s from one carbon and the 2s from the other and they would mix together. We don't need to necessarily draw that whole thing. What's important about this, so I'll get rid of those for now, is the ordering of the orbitals, the molecular orbitals, which is what we put in the center of the diagram, and knowing what order they come in so we can put the correct number of electrons into them. And just again, the, as I said, it's these two orbitals here within the 2p that switch their order. This is the correct order for 
boron, carbon, and nitrogen, where you have pi coming before sigma. But if you had oxygen, fluorine, or neon, you would flip these two and put sigma at the bottom and then pi. So those two are the ones that flip. All right, so for this structure, now we just need to figure out how many electrons there are. So for C2+, plus, we have two carbons, which each have four valence electrons because they're group four. And then for the plus charge, we take away one electron. So we have a total of seven electrons. So C2 would have eight electrons. C2 with a positive charge has one less than that, which is seven. And so we're going to put seven electrons into this diagram starting from lowest energy to highest energy. So we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And now we have to calculate the bond order for this. So bond order, as we did many times in class, is one half. We're going to take the number of electrons that are in bonding orbitals, so those are orbitals that don't have a star next to them, and so the bonding orbitals, we have two electrons in this bonding orbital, and then three electrons that are in the pi bonding orbital, so of our, out of our seven electrons, five of them are bonding. And then we have two more electrons, these two in the sigma star, that are anti-bonding, so those two are going to get subtracted to calculate the bond order. The sum of these two numbers that we're subtracting should be equal to the total number of electrons. So we have seven total electrons, five are in bonding orbitals, two are in anti-bonding orbitals. And so when we calculate that out, we get a bond order of three halves or one and one half as is written here. All right, so that's going to be choice D. Now we could have helped ourselves in this problem because what we should recognize is that if we have an odd number of electrons, in this case seven, the bond order is going to be fractional. So I'll write that out here odd number of electrons means we're going to have a fractional bond order, something 0.5. All right, so we could have eliminated choices A, C, and E because if there's an odd number of electrons, you can't have a whole number of bond orders, 0, 1, or 2. So that means choices B and D are the only ones that are even possible. We, to distinguish between those two, we do need to figure out the electron configuration, calculate the bond order, and that gives us choice D. But we could have at least eliminated down to two answers, all right, and then if we go to the next one, this is a very similar one because it also deals with C2 or with um, an anionic version of C2. We want to know which of the following statements is false. Now, if we look at the first two statements here, C2 is paramagnetic, C2 is diamagnetic. Um, these both can't be true because those are basically stating the opposite of each other. So one of those two is going to be false. So that can help us. We know that one of these two is going to be false, so there's at least one false statement. But we also have to then determine between choice D, C, and D is, um, you know, are any of these false. So between A and B, one is going to be true, one is going to be false. They both can't be true, they both can't be false. It's because every molecule is either paramagnetic or diamagnetic. But then we also have to look at choice D, and C, and D. So first we're going to deal with neutral C2. So that's going to be the same orbital diagram we did just now. Sigma 2s, sigma star 2s, pi 2p, sigma 2p, pi star, and sigma star. So I didn't draw those in particularly straight fashion, but they're all there. And we're going to have eight electrons this time because it's just neutral C2. So what we get is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now what you'll see is that all the electrons are paired. So these two are paired, these two are paired these two and these two, every spin up electron has a spin down electron in the same orbital as it. So that means that the, if, because all electrons are paired, we identify this molecule as being diamagnetic. All right, so this one is true, but this one we're looking for the false statement is one of our false statements. We'll put a star next to it. Now we have to decide if C and D are also false, one or both of those. Uh, or I guess in this case, one of those two could be false to get two of the above as the correct answer. So if we go to C2, 2 minus, we're going to have the same orbitals, sigma 2s, sigma star 2s, pi 2p, sigma 2p, pi star 2p, sigma star 2p. So those are the orbital levels, but this time we're adding two more electrons because of the two minus charge, so it's gonna be a total of 10 electrons. Neutral C2 is eight, C2 is two minus charge would have 10. And so if we go through this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, this is the diagram for C2, two minus. Now what it's asking us about is, 
is the carbon-carbon bond stronger than CH3CH3 or is the carbon-carbon bond shorter than CH3CH3? So if we're gonna make comparisons about bond length and bond strength, we need to think about the bond order. So for C22 minus, the bond order is one half. We have 10 electrons and of those 10, eight of them are in bonding orbitals. These two, four, six, eight are all in orbitals that don't have stars next to them. Eight of our 10 are in bonding orbitals, just these two here are anti-bonding. And so we get a bond order of three. And so the question is, how does this bond order compare to the one in CH3CH3, which is called ethane? Now for this molecule here, CH3CH3, we can't draw them like an orbital diagram because it's not diatomic, but we can make an estimation from the Lewis structure what the bond order is. So for CH3CH3, we're gonna distribute the hydrogens equally, three on each carbon like this. And what you'll notice is right now, both carbons already have four bonds, three to hydrogen, one to carbon. So we're not gonna add any double bonds to the structure. So the bond order in this case is a single bond, one between the two carbons. And so if we're comparing C22 minus, which has a bond order of three, or this molecule CH3CH3, which has a bond order of one, this bond, because it has a higher bond order, should be shorter. Remember, the higher bond order makes the bond shorter, and it should also be stronger. The higher bond order makes the bond stronger. So this bond here in CH2 minus should be shorter and stronger than the bond in CH3CH3. So choice C, the carbon-carbon bond in C22 minus is stronger than the one in CH3. That should be true. It's a triple bond versus a single bond. The carbon-carbon bond in C22 minus is shorter than the one in CH3 CH3. That is also true. The triple bond should be shorter than the single bond. So both C and D are true, which means that the only false statement is going to be choice A, that C2 is paramagnetic. Okay. So it took us a while to go through all those. There were two diagrams we had to consider, a few different answer choices, but the only one that's actually wrong or false is choice A. All right, the last one here deals with the molecular orbital of CO. Now, we did not specifically talk about the molecular orbital diagrams of molecules that have two different atoms in it, but if we give you a problem that deals with that, we are going to tell you which molecular orbital energy levels to use. So in this case, for CO, we have a carbon, which if it was C2, it would follow one, one diagram, oxygen would follow a different one, but we're telling you here that it has the same MO energy levels as N2. So the orbitals for N2 are the same that we've just been dealing with, so it's going to be sigma 2s, sigma star 2s, pi 2p, sigma 2p, pi star, and then sigma star. So same orbital energy diagram that we've been dealing with in the last two problems for C2 and C2 minus and so on. So if we have CO, we just need to put how many electrons into it. So carbon has four valence electrons from group four. Oxygen's in group six, so it has six valence electrons. So we're gonna put 10 electrons into this diagram here and then figure out which question, which of these statements is um, true or false. Okay, so for 10 electrons, we're gonna go two, four, six, eight, and then 10. So that's gonna be the diagram, and let's look at these statements there. So in choice A, the highest energy electrons occupy anti-bonding orbitals. What we see here is that the two last electrons we put in, the highest energy ones, occupy the sigma 2p. Because it doesn't have a star next to it, this is a bonding orbital. So this one is false. For choice B, six molecular orbitals contain electrons. Well, if we have 10 electrons, we see how many of these orbitals are filled. We have this orbital, this orbital, these two, and this one. So a total of one, two, three, four, five. Only five orbitals actually contain electrons. So this one is also false. Choice C, there are two unpaired electrons. We see that in this diagram, all the electrons are paired. Remember, unpaired means that you would have a spin-up electron without a spin-down electron in the same orbital, but we see that all the orbitals are doubly occupied. Spin-up, spin-down, spin-up, spin-down, up, down, up, down, up, down. All electrons are paired, so there are no, no zero unpaired electrons. This is diamagnetics. This is false. And then finally, choice D, the last one to consider, the bond order is three. So if we calculate the bond order for this molecule, we actually have the same arrangement as we got for C22 minus, 10 electrons. So the bond order is gonna be one half. Of those 10 electrons, eight of them are bonding. These two, which are in sigma, these four, which are in pi, those two that are in sigma 2p, total of eight electrons that are in bonding orbitals. Only these two, the sigma star 2s, are anti-bonding. 
and so we once again get a bond order of three. So if you have 10 electrons in one of these microorbital diagrams, no matter which atoms they are, CO, C22 minus N2, all those different possibilities that give you 10 electrons, you're going to get a bond order of three. So this one is in fact true, and that would be the correct statement then. All right, so that takes us to the end of this review, a little bit longer than the previous ones, but I did want to make sure that we went through all these different topics in Chapter 4. If you have any additional questions, please contact me, and I will see you guys in class later today.